Hello, and welcome to our next presentation. On behalf of the MIT CDOIQ Virtual Symposium, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors who have continued to support the symposium during this very challenging year. Before we thank our partners, we'd like to ask that sometime during the symposium's breaks that you visit our partners' virtual booths. You can also visit the content hub on the MIT CDOIQ website for some great partner resources. We'd like to thank the following partners, Deloitte, Informatica, Privacy and Analytics, Dowex, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, Tamer, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Boomi, Caserta, Citizen, Data Kitchen, Garage, Okira, Pylog, Click, ThoughtSpot, Eckerson, Global IDs, Snowflake, Starburst. And as I said, please make every effort to visit our partners, use the virtual passport, because without them and our partner support, this symposium could not be held. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We hope that you enjoyed your lunch and are having a good experience with the virtual conference so far. Um, we are now moving on with session four, and I am pleased to announce our next speaker, Paul Walsh. Paul is the Global Director, Consumer Weather Strategy for IBM Services. He's going to be talking about rethinking weather, the resilience imperative, and the power of data. Uh, feel free to submit any questions that you have for Paul in the section below uh, the session window. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. Thank you, Gertrude. And, and thank you, folks, for the invitation to come present here today. Um, talking about my favorite topic and hopefully everybody's favorite topic. While I'm talking here, I'm gonna see if I can successfully pull up my presentation. I think I'm good. Gertrude, can you see? Yep, yeah, looking good, so. Oh, success. There we okay, go. Well, great, great. All right, well, yeah, thanks again, everybody. I, I've been looking forward to this presentation, uh, for giving this presentation to you folks for a long time. Of course, initially I was looking forward to uh, doing this in person at MIT. Uh, but of course, now in the new world we live, everything we do, it seems, is, is via, via Zoom. Um, and um, I'm adapting like uh, all of the rest of us. Um, the, the title of my presentation, uh, Rethinking Whether the Resilience Imperative uh, and the Power of Data, is something that I've been presenting to organizations and groups for a long time. But one of the first presentations that I did under this umbrella, get it umbrella, was um, soon after I'd been, I'd been hired by the Weather Channel companies and I was presenting at um, the Philadelphia Federal Reserve for an organization there. And um, the, 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 the title of my presentation was Rethinking Weather or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Weather Channel. And the reason that I came up with that, that, that um, title was because I, I, I and I'll we'll be talking about this as we go through this presentation, I am of the view that by leveraging weather data, we can create additional resilience and by leveraging technology, by leveraging AI, we can help to basically help society, government businesses to deal with the increasingly impactful weather that we're seeing on, a, on a almost a daily basis. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was relevant in 2011, I think it was when I did it, but it's even more relevant today. And it's also even more relevant for the audience that I'm talking to here, people that are in the data business, chief data officers and, and the like. So what, I, what I'm gonna do today, and I, I kind of been racking my brain because I know I'm, I, I'm uh, slated to do a 50 minute presentation, which on stage is fine, but doing it on a Zoom like this, I've not done one at this length um, in the past. So what I've done is I've broken up the agenda into what I'm calling chapters. And I'm basically gonna tell a story and tell it, the story is gonna be my story initially, but then how my story has evolved over time as it relates to uh, sort of a data story and the data integration study story and how you know the, the, uh, the weather company has been uh, acquired by IBM and all of a sudden the scale of this solution has improved, increased dramatically that, and that takes us right into this new normal that we're living in now, which is really uh, increasingly a sort of a data and AI driven new normal. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with what I'm calling now rethinking, rethinking the weather, um, and which is really sort of talking about the next normal, how, how uh, uh, technology and, and organizations are sort of adjusting the way that they're leveraging uh, data like this and analytics like this uh, across uh, many different channels. 
So as I mentioned before, I, I always like to start with a, a little bit of a background in terms of my story, because I, I typically, when I do a presentation like this with an organization like this, I'm always a little bit of a, of a unicorn. I kind of come in talking about the weather to a bunch of really super smart data, in this case, data chief data officers and people that are in the data business. But in, real, in the reality is I've, I'm in the data business and have been for many, many years. Um, I actually started uh, down this path of, of weather, weather forecasting, and then data and analytics um, right out of high school. Uh, when I was 17 years old, um, I had uh, really not a lot of options, and I just, so I decided I would join the Air Force. And when I joined the Air Force, um, or in any military um, uh, organization, you take an aptitude test. And I had an aptitude to be, uh, according to their test, either be a fireman, uh, uh, an aircraft jet mechanic, uh, a radio operator, or a weather observer. Um, I had a friend who was a fireman, and he said all they did was wash trucks. So I decided I didn't want to be a fireman. Um, I can't fix anything. Um, which didn't say much for their aptitude test. So there's no way I was going to be a jet mechanic. So I decided to be a radio operator because I thought that was cool. And I had seen a movie called No Time for Sergeants, and that's what they did on their planes. Uh, but they came back and they said, sorry, that job has been, or that, that slot is um, now taken and you, you can't do that. And so by default, I became a weather observer. Um, and lo and behold, I spent 20 years both being a weather observer initially and then being a weather forecaster. And in the military, weather information is used very specifically to provide decision support, decision assistance, and guidance to literally to military planners and literally to war planners. So the photo you see on the left is me um, just after the, uh, the end of the Gulf War, where I, I spent um, uh, a lot of time on the ground with the 101st Airborne Division, you know, providing insights and, and um, tactical insights as well as strategic insights to decision makers. The reason that I gave you that background is that when I left the Air Force, when I retired um, after 20 years and, and you know, getting a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, I was hired by a startup outside of Philadelphia, which is where I am to this day, um, that was looking to use the same kind of, uh, of approach only instead of using that approach to help, you know, launch a helicopter air assault into Iraq, to use it to help retailers do a better job of planning for uh, product sales and product and planning for how many how many pairs of shorts they should they should buy from Asia and and how they should dis distribute those by having an understanding how the weather was going to influence consumer demand. So that's how I got into this sort of weird space. I did that for about 10 years and then I was hired. Uh, by a startup, where so I did about a year uh, within a financial services firm, and then I was hired by a company called Verisk Analytics, uh, which one of my former Verisk colleagues is talking now at the same exact time as I am, uh, and a different uh, and a different group. And then to take this right back to where I am today, I was hired by the Weather Channel companies to start an analytics business. And the reason that I was hired was it became very apparent to the, to the leadership of the Weather Channel companies that the real value that the Weather Channel was providing was really under the waterline. It was the data more so than the media. And they basically were undergoing a transformation and transforming the company from being a media company that also had data into a data and analytics company that also, by the way, had media. That it was from that platform, and I spent six or seven years um, with the Weather Channel proper, and then became the Weather Company. Um, did a lot of I actually did a lot of on-air work. So if you're a real super fan of the Weather Channel, you may actually recognize me. I used to do a lot of on-air work right here from my home office. Um, anyway, I'm getting sidetracked here. Um, what ended up happening then is that um, I guess it's been almost four or five years from uh, ago now. Um, uh, I, IBM initially started a partnership with us. Um, that lasted about, I don't know, six months to a year, and then they acquired us, and, and now the rest is history. And I'm going to take you through how that evolution has really sort of accelerated the, the use and leveraging of, of weather data. Um, the quote, by the way, on the screen, uh, know the enemy, know yourself, your victory will, will never uh, be, I can't read the back of it. But know the ground, know the weather, you'll, your victory will then be total. This is something that I was given when I, when I left the Air Force. It's like a going away gift, and, it, and it's always stayed with me because it is really sort of a, a, a North Star for me as it relates to helping businesses, helping um, organizations, government organizations become more resilient based on their ability to leverage weather data. So that was kind of a long introduction, but I always feel like I need to sort of you know, frame out you know, where I'm coming from because I think it helps in terms of telling the, the balance of the story. So, you know, when we talk about weather data and the weather data opportunity, the, the real key and the, the real importance of weather data is that it is at the foundation of driving consumer behavior. So this basically is a, 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 
a view of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So all of these different sort of external drivers that drive all of our, our behavior on a day-to-day -day basis. And weather um, sits right at the very base. Its very foundation is to drive in consumer behavior. Um, it's, it basically is, is how we, it, it, it shapes the way that we, that we, uh, that we act, every, the way that we act every day. It shapes how we decide what we're gonna be doing. It shapes from a retail perspective what we're gonna be able to buy. So it is a very, very uh, descriptive and important driver of consumer behavior, which of course translates directly into business. The really important piece here though, is that weather data as it relates to human behavior is very, very measurable and it's becoming increasingly measurable. And you'll see as we talk through the presentation today how important that's, that's becoming. It's also of all of the sort of the external drivers that you can predict, it is, yes, in fact, the most predictable. And so by understanding that sort of historical relationship and then turning that forward, you can now understand things that you may not have understood before in terms of how people and, and um, um, organizations are gonna be impacted by the change in the weather. And, and why is that important? It, it, it's important because it directly the, the impact of the weather on all of us in terms of the way we live our lives and the way we spend our money has a direct impact on the global, on the, on the global economy and the U.S. economy specifically. Um, and the example here is from a research that was done by the National Center for Atmospheric Research a couple of years ago. And basically what they found was that um, the impact of the weather annually is about $485 billion. And that's, that's not severe weather. That's just variations and fluctuations in temperatures that are warmer than normal or colder than normal or higher the humidity than normal. Um, everything that sort of deviates from the mean when you talk about any kind of seasonality has a direct influence on, on all of us. And that influence is actually increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the, the, the number of high impact events, so that was just, just normal weather causes almost like a half a trillion dollar in var variation in the, in the GDP in the US every year. The high impact events, the, the events that um, the National Weather Service um, basically categorizes and tracks, which they define as uh, uh, $1 billion or more disasters, um, are increasing as well. So you can just see this is, a, this is a, uh, uh, an image directly from the NOAA site. It's to date, uh, as of today. And you can see that the number and the frequency of those high impact events are increasing every year. And in fact, now 2020, here we are um, still probably three weeks out before the peak of the hurricane season. And we're already um, looking at eight or nine storms and we're predicting a, a hyperactive uh, season. And so the, the, um, the impact of high impact events is, is going up as well. Um, and of course, climate is having an impact on this. Now, I mentioned earlier that you know, in my uh, uh, initial discussion, when I right joined the Weather Channel at the Philly Fed, I was talking about the, 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 the risks and the opportunities inherent in, and climate change. And you can see from the headlines almost every day, these are recent headlines. So the California heat wave that is, uh, that's happening right now um, could, could rival uh, uh, heat, heat waves in the past. Um, the uh, hurricane season, I, I mentioned that before. And then uh, just the screen grab from my Twitter feed is, is literally from today. Uh, and then the Death Valley may have set the, the record for hot temperatures uh, just yesterday. So all of this stuff is happening. It's all happening right now, and it's happening in an increasingly, um, the, the frequency is happening in, 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 in an increasing way. And so the, the relevance then to my uh, discussion and my, the title of my presentation um, back in 2011 or 2012 is even higher now. Um, this, this image, this is something that, that I've always kept sort of, and I use it whenever I can to sort of talk about the, the reality of the weather, the impact of the weather today and climate. Um, Stephen Colbert had Heidi Cullen. Heidi Cullen uh, used to be on the Weather Channel. She was sort of a climate expert. Um, uh, she, she's a friend of mine. Uh, she was on the Colbert Show when it was the Colbert Show, talking about a book she had written. And Stephen Colbert said this line: "Climate is really just thousands of little weathers." And I always, I always, I've always taken that with me, because the reality is the the, the issues that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis are weather issues but you can't separate the weather issues from the broader climate issues. And you can't separate the fact that we're seeing this in increasing impact of weather on increasingly amounts of people. So you can see how the, 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 the challenge and the, and the problems that are caused by climate change um, are real time. So these aren't, these aren't 2050 issues, these are real time issues. And so the, the, um, 
the importance of, of sustainability and resilience increases almost every day. And it's even more important now with the, uh, with the, the COVID impact. So as I mentioned, the impact is increasing. And when, when I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about impact here, the context is within the impact of the weather on all of us. And then it translates into the economy. Now, one of the reasons that the impact of the weather and the weather forecast, which is important, is increasing, is the fact that forecasts are getting increasingly accurate. Um, of course, I'm, I've, I've been in the weather business for uh, more than 30 years now. And so I've heard every joke there is about being paid for being wrong. But the reality is these, the weather forecasts today are amazingly accurate. They're not right all the time, but they are amazingly accurate. And for, it's for that reason that uh, I'll, I'll venture a guess that every one of you has got a weather forecast at some point on your mobile phone. And you know, most of the, the de developed world, um, these weather forecasts are distributed um, on mobile phones and people have, the, uh, have access to them. And therefore, most uh, of us, um, even if in an unthinking way, are, are planning our lives based on, on what that weather forecast is saying, because we're assuming it's going to be right. So that accuracy and the availability means that the importance of that data on um, consumers, on citizens around the world is increasing dramatically. And the fact that now we are that we are sort of connected via social media means that when there's any kind of an unusual weather event, the messaging around that is is exponentially um, increased just by people going on Facebook or going on Twitter and having a conversation about it. So when you put all those things together, you can see that the the weather forecast and the weather data that that's just out there generally is having an increasingly uh, important um, impact. On, uh, on all of us, on, on your customers, and also on, on our citizens. The good news here is that, as I mentioned before, the impact of the weather on all of us, on our businesses, is very, very measurable. And as I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's very predictable. So when you can put those two things together, you can start to think about creating really interesting uh, ways to help people from a digital perspective even become more resilient um, and more proactive as it relates to the weather. Now, one of the things that happened, I think, when um, IBM acquired, well, let me, let me back up for a minute. Um, just to give you some perspective in terms of the scale of the weather company and part of the reason why IBM acquired us and how that now uh, enabled us to really, to really uh, participate in the, the sort of the scaling and the integration of this topic. Um, one of the things I mentioned before that the, the weather, the, at the time, the weather channel company, now the weather company had sort of trans, transformed itself from a, from a media company first um, with the data and data second to a data and analytics company first with the media uh, as a secondary piece, is that they created a, a technology that enabled us to, um, using cloud technology, to communicate to um, virtually everybody on earth if needed. The, um, the, the volume of forecasts, and this isn't even recent data, this is probably a couple of years old. So basically we serve like 45 billion daily forecast calls. Um, we literally were able to, and, and, and this, is, this is actually increasing, I'm thinking this will probably increase since this map, this chart has been put together, but we, uh, we map and we forecast the weather for 2.2 billion locations around the world, and we update that every 15 minutes. Uh, about 400 data terabytes of data is processed every day, and of course it varies based on storms. If there's more storms, there's more, more, um, more um, usage. And then 250 million dollar unique visitors, 250 million, I'm sorry, um, across the world. So it's this mm -hmm. very big, giant sort of cloud-based technology, which is one of the reasons that IBM became very interested in us. Um, the the emphasis on scale really is is meant to help us. Um, create a forecast leveraging all kinds of different types of data. Uh, so, for example, we'll put in, pull in uh, smartphone pressure observations and bring that into our model. Um, we've got a very large location-based services uh, model at the Weather Company app. Um, we are, uh, you know, I mentioned before, we're able to scale very, very, very quickly uh, and then create real-time forecasts upon request. And uh, as I mentioned before, the forecast is very precise from a geographical perspective, so down to a half a kilometer updated every 15 minutes. And, and, and we create a bespoke weather forecast that brings in a lot of about 162 different sort of elements that we use machine learning to optimize it. And the, real, the, the, the benefit of that is that we're able to create a forecast that is, that is as based on third party verification as the most precise and also the most accurate forecast out there. The, and the reason I mentioned that is that because of the fact that the, the because of we 
develop that that technology infrastructure to be able to handle the, the the volume of traffic and also the ability to get down to that level of granularity in terms of geography as well as accuracy. The forecast of, from the weather company now is the native app on every iPhone on the planet, on, uh, on every um, uh, Samsung uh, phone on the planet. It's the native uh, Google app or the Google. If you do a Google search, it'll come back and it's on Facebook. So it's everywhere. The reason I mention that is that that becomes a, a, a very, very significant and interesting platform that we've been using and leveraging uh, to help our clients. Because if you can understand the, the, the weather and what the weather forecast is going to be, you can do better. You can do a better job of, of anticipating when customers are going to be needed. Um, I mentioned obviously that the that IBM acquired the weather company, and 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 I think that that was a um, a, a very sort of tra big transformational event as it relates to the sort of the, the global and the sort of corporate wide view of uh, rethinking weather, because all of a sudden, uh, whereas I was in a company of about 900 people, which I felt like I was a really really big company because I'm a little startup guy, now all of a sudden I'm part of a company with you know, 350,000 people plus or minus dripping wet. Um, and I've got now colleagues uh, all over the world. Um, and we're having these kind of conversations with, with businesses in basically every country in the world, um, any company that in, in across every industry. So retail, CPG, energy, insurance, et cetera, et cetera. All of a sudden the floodgates are open and, and more and more companies are looking more um, sort of seriously at this sort of data asset and this data resource as being something that can really drive value. Uh, a couple of quick uh, quick notes in terms of some of the, the innovations that have happened or, or that actually are happening within the weather company. Uh, one of them is the development of what's called the IBM Graph, um, Global High Resolution Atmospheric Forecasting System. And basically it's leveraging all of the the, uh, the technologies and available in the cloud technologies, as well as the computing uh, power and AI that resides within uh, broader IBM to create a weather forecast that, that, that will provide the same level of accuracy and the same level of um, geographic coverage everywhere in the world as we do now throughout the developed world. So when you go to somewhere in, in India um, which may be out in the middle of nowhere, you'll still be able to get a, a weather forecast that will be uh, as, as, as accurate as the science allows and it will continually get accurate, get more and more accurate. Um, this, uh, the, the image on the right is kind of gratuitous uh, that Steve Leisman from CNBC, he's a senior economic reporter. Um, a quick side note, um, when I was with the Weather Channel before we were acquired by IBM Weather Channel, uh, and the weather company was part owned by NBC. So I used to do a lot of work with uh, CNBC. So Steve is a, a, like a friend of mine. And he's the guy that, that wrote this article. And in a little uh, uh, bit of trivia for you, Steve is a, a, like a massive weather geek. And so he was loving you know, writing this article uh, for this, uh, for, uh, around this, um, this new technology that we've developed. Uh, the other thing, just, just quickly, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that, that are happening in terms of from, a, from an innovation perspective in terms of leveraging this kind of data. Uh, the other one I want to call out is, is IBM Pairs. I think this is a great example of the, 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 the value that has come out of the, the uh, acquisition of the weather company by IBM. Um, IBM developed through IBM Research a platform called the Physical Analytics Integrated Repository of Services, which is a mouthful. Um, but it's uh, called pairs for short. And basically it's a, it's a platform that brings in uh, massive amounts of ge geospatial data. So map, satellite data, weather, uh, drone data, there's uh, data, COVID data that's all being brought in. And the reason for that is that we wanted to be able to provide for data science organizations and data organizations in general, uh, a way to curate all of this data. So it's all in one place and it's easy to get to because that turned out to be a real problem. There's lots and lots and lots of data out there, but really to be able to maximize it, it needs to be sort of uh, at hand. And so that was the that was a sort of the impetus behind developing this. But, and I'm, I'm sharing it here within the sort of the whole context of how the, um, the, the this, this concept or how the uh, application of weather uh, uh, and analytics and data is, is scaling. Um, and I think this is a good example of, of some of the kind of tools that are, that are happening now. So in terms of this this journey, so now we we talked about the importance of of uh, of weather as a as a metric as it relates to the economy as it relates to all of us, um, has as it impacts business, um, how the, um, the the use of this kind of information now is is dramatically and quickly uh, being adopted around the world globally in a, in a large part I think because of the uh, or as a result of the acquisition of, of the weather company by IBM. 
and now we're we're sort of you know in this in this new normal uh, but within the new normal context um, the way that I've always sort of talked about leveraging uh, weather data like this from an analytical perspective from an integrated perspective is is looking at it from from an old paradigm versus a new paradigm now I mentioned before that I'm an, I'm an old Air Force and Army guy and 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 I kind of absconded with this um, phraseology from when I was in the Air Force and, and because we used to say the same thing in those days and I just it just carried over with me. And the, so the old paradigm around weather was cope and avoid. And by that, I mean, companies would make plans, do the best they can, hope for the best without really factoring in the impact of weather. Part of the reason was because there was this old uh, chestnut that weather forecasts aren't, aren't really accurate. You can't know in advance, which is not true. And also by not worrying about it, that it sort of helps you to sort of avoid any uh, blame when things uh, go to hell in a handbasket. Um, and so that there was a, you know, uh, businesses and governments kind of had it out there because they could say, well, it's, you know, it's not my fault. It's because of the weather and who can predict the weather. Well, that's, a, that's, that's an old paradigm. That, that, that is, uh, that is uh, the way companies were, were able to get away. That was something that companies were able to get away with maybe 10 or 15, 20 years ago, but, but no more. And by the way, just for perspective, the, uh, the image that I'm showing you is in Atlanta. This is about uh, 2014, I think it was, when there was a, a massive snowstorm hit Atlanta. It was about two inches of snow and the entire city was shut down. That, predict that forecast was, was known well in advance and yet they still had this sort of uh, snowmageddon as they talked about. The new paradigm, and this directly relates to the work that you all do as, as chief data officers and people that work with an analytic shop, is uh, to anticipate and exploit. Now, I know exploit is a, is a kind of a harsh word, but this comes out of my days in the military and, and my days with the 101st Airborne Division. And basically what it means is that you ought to be able to understand in advance the effect of the impact that the weather is going to have on any sort of uh, act, human activity, whether it's retail sales or traffic in Atlanta or uh, energy outages, um, all of those things are measurable. And if you can measure it and we can predict the weather, therefore you can, you can predict the weather. If you can predict the weather, you can anticipate that an event is gonna happen. You should be able to use that information to, uh, to uh, create value. Let me just put it that way. Now the, 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 the image here it's an iconic image. This is General Eisenhower sort of wishing the 101st Airborne paratroopers well um, right before they uh, boarded the airplanes to go parachute into Normandy as part of the D-Day landing. The reason I like to use this example is that the timing of D-Day was based on the weather forecast. Um, it, it, was, it, it was known as the most famous weather forecast ever. Um, and the, it was a very, very dicey, very touch and go sort of forecast. But at the end of the day, um, the um, uh, Admiral Stagg, I think his name was, I mean, he may not have been an Admiral, but Stagg was definitely his name, uh, who made that call, basically um, resu it, it resulted in at least some surprise on the part of the Germans because their weather forecasters didn't think the weather was going to be good enough. So it was, a, it was the first example of how you can leverage weather data and analytics to make a decision that's going to provide you with um, advantage, in this case, advantage on the battlefield. But now, of course, what I do is I, I work with um, clients mostly, although I do have government clients to, to do the same thing, only using weather data, using analytics, using other data sets to create, um, to create um, uh, opportunity for the, for the businesses. Um, one, one of the things I want to do now is that, and, and again, this actually goes back to the, to the the, the value of being acquired by IBM. So because we were acquired by IBM, all of a sudden now we had the resources to go through and do some really interesting uh, surveys and create. And we created a white paper. Um, I'm using the railway because I had no no part in actually writing it, but we had some really smart people that, that did, which again is another great um, uh, outcome of being acquired by IBM. Um, basically, it was, a, it was a white paper that that meant that was that was meant to get get uh, a sense for how. Uh, executives around the world viewed the uh, the impact of weather and the opportunity around leveraging weather data um, in their operations. Uh, so it's called Just Add Weather. I've actually got a link on this presentation for it, um, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be made available to all of you. But basically what happened was we did a, a survey of a thousand C-level executives globally, distributed as you see, uh, to basically go in and, and sort of pull them to get a sense of, of the value that they felt 
um, could be derived um, using weather data, but not just looking at weather data, but looking at weather data within a, the context of an integration into systems. Um, in terms of the number of folks that we talked to, you can see how it all, uh, how it all sort of uh, spread out. Um, it was all sea level, including 140 chief data officers across basically every industry. So um, a lot of markets around the world, a lot of chief data officers around the world. And I won't go through the entire uh, white paper, obviously, but uh, what, I, what I did is I sort of called out some of the key highlights that came out of it. And the one that I think is the most important was the, the sort of six key business and technical challenge that, that, um, that they called out. Um, but also um, there, there was an overwhelming sense that having, a, having an analytical understanding of how the weather affected, affected a, a business or an organization could be tremendously valuable. So in terms of the, the, the top three business challenges, um, these, are, these, are, these are all kind of related, but almost 70% basically said uh, one of the big challenges of, around leveraging weather was uncertainty about how the weather data can actually create business value. Um, I, I would venture to say that uh, virtually all businesses that have any kind of weather exposure, so uh, insurance industry, the energy, energy industry, but even retail, CPG, um, uh, understand that the weather impacts their business. Um, most of them buy weather data in some form or fashion, but most of the time that weather data is not really sort of integrated uh, into uh, in systems. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of examples of where, where that's happening now. But there, there is a lot of uncertainty about what the, what the ultimate value can be, but it's, it's a lot. Um, there's also the, the problem of actually incorporating the weather data into operational processes, which is really the key. Uh, the weather data in itself is like any other any other data. If it's not processed, if it's not analyzed, if it's not integrated with other data points to create a, to create a, you know, a, a, for example, a more accurate demand forecast or a better marketing plan. Um, and so that's that's 60% um, uh, of, of the sea level execs we talked to, and then about and it's sort of related also to this whole idea about uncertainty about using weather data in decision making. So without without an analytic um, sort of wrapper without a probabilistic wrapper around, around that data. It's very difficult to make a scalable decision. So those are sort of the, the challenges that the, um, the, the, the executive sort of shared back with us. And the top three technical challenges, which I, I think actually are, are not as big a deal as the, as the operation challenges, but you know, inaccurate weather data, um, I think that's just a function of the fact that people have a sort of ingrained um, bias against weather data, weather forecasters. Maybe that's just me because I've been doing this for so long. Uh, but the reality is that the weather forecasts are, are, are very, very accurate and there's ways to use the data in ways that will sort of um, smooth out any sort of anomalies on that. Uh, weather data availability, again, the weather data is available everywhere, but sometimes it's not as easy to get to. Um, and also it's not, it's, it's not just easy to just turn on a, a pipe of weather data and have it flow into an operation and then automating decisions based on weather data. All things that are, I think of the, of the six challenges that we, that we just went through, the operational ones and the technical ones, these are the easiest ones to deal with, frankly. Um, but that's sort of the perception of uh, uh, the C-level executives that we talked to, including 140 chief data officers. The one thing that we did, that we did get a sense of, and again, this is just based on the, uh, the estimates of the, of the executives that we talked to was the, uh, the size, the potential size of the opportunity, not of weather data, but of weather data as it, as it sort of, um, for example, integrated into, a, into an ERP system, integrated into SAP, for example, or into salesforce.com. Um, and basically what we found is that 88% indicated they could, they could see a one to 5% revenue growth opportunity. Now, the variation in that number is really a function of the type of business that we're talking to. So if you're talking to a home center retailer, for example, it's probably going to be on the higher end of that 1% to 5% because they, they are tremendously weather impacted. If you're talking to a, um, an insurance company, it's going to be on the higher end of that. Um, and the lower end would be companies that have less of a weather exposure, but they still have weather exposure. So companies that have uh, you know, off the mall sort of um, uh, traffic coming in, that's, they, even if they're not selling weather impacted products, they're still gonna be impacted by, by the weather. And a 98% um, estimated a one to 10% cost reduction opportunity by basically being more uh, able to be more responsive uh, to changes in the weather and, and being able to be more responsive and proactive in terms of how those changes in the weather are gonna change the, the behavior and the wants and needs of the customers or the citizens. 
So the, the, the big takeaway here, and really the, the sort of the premise of my initial premise around rethinking weather is that to date, weather data has always been looked at as data. Everybody's got weather data it's on our phone, so it's not really that big of a deal. But the reality is, if you can pull that sword out of the stone and you can mine that the, the, the value out of not the weather data, but the insights that it can, that it can create, and then take that insight and integrate it into something, integrate it into an ERP, integrate an SAP or, or uh, Oracle or any of those kind of systems, then, then the value equation becomes really, really significant. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take you through some examples of, of customers that, uh, that I've been involved with just to give you a sense of um, what companies are doing now, um, what, what some of the value, the value that can be derived out of those. Now I mentioned the um, IBM uh, Institute for Business Value, which is the, the, the part of IBM that actually did that, the white paper on, um, on the weather impact. Um, also our, our part of that, they also do benchmarking. And so one of the sort of the rule of thumb benchmarks that came up with was that uh, a CPG or retail company that decreases monthly forecast error. So think of a sales for, a forecast, sales forecast error by 1% could increase the revenue by $10 million for every $1 billion of sales. And that's really a function of uh, having better in stock positions, having enough product when the when the demand is there, and not having too much when the demand isn't there, you know, pricing optimization, everything else. So there's all all kinds of good things happen when you can uh, improve the accuracy of forecast. Um, so this this um, story, this is a real life story um, that um, uh, is a, a client engagement that I that I was involved with and am involved with um, that actually started a couple of years ago. Um, it's about a $30 billion grocer. Um, I spoke at a conference like this, um, only I was in person at that time, it was pre-COVID. And um, I was um, uh, in, the, in the audience with the CIO, as it turned out, of this, of this grocery client. Um, afterwards, he came up to me and he said, listen, we're, we've been experimenting with weather, but we're not having a lot of luck, can you help us? So, so we did, we, we brought some of our uh, data scientists in to work with them. Uh, to work with their data science team to see what they're doing and see if we can help them and also we provide them access to the weather company data that I just mentioned because one of the problems that they were having was the weather data that this is not in the US it was, it was a different country but the weather data they were using was was basically um, only located at airports and they didn't have the coverage they've got you know 2,000 stores so we brought in our weather data and our, and our data scientists to work with them and they did what we call a POC or proof of concept. So we basically, we, we went in and we looked at a subset of product categories. Um, one of the categories was pork chops. I don't know why that's always stuck in my mind. It always did, it seemed odd, but there was a, a very significant um, correlation as it turned out. Um, and what we found is that by integrating the weather data into the demand forecast, this is actually uh, within SAP, you know, SAP's forecast and replenishment system, they could reduce that forecast error by up to 24% for the most highly sort of impacted you know, seasonal product category. And you know, that, that's a lot, obviously. And so on the back of that, then they've taken that data, they've scaled it um, across the business. And so now every day, there's weather data flowing in, it's going into the model that's been developed, it's, and it's adjusting and optimizing the, the replenishment forecast um, for the products going into the stores. And it's, that's happening um, basically every day. Um, but what they've told me, and they, they, they I, I don't have the specific numbers here, but I got an ish number from them, is that they're seeing uh, anywhere from a two to 5% reduction in forecast error by, by doing this. And that, now that's not just for the pork chop category, that's for the entire business. It's a $30 billion business. So you can see that the, the value that's inherent in being able to have a better sense of how that changing weather is gonna shape what people are gonna be wanting and needing, therefore enabling you to make sure you have enough of the product that your customer's gonna be wanting, but not too much of the stuff they're not gonna be wanting, has a direct, direct, dramatic, and a really, really big impact. And again, rethinking weather, not thinking about whether just some sort of data source, data source that everybody has, but thinking about it as a strategic resource that if properly processed, if properly analyzed and then integrated, can, and also combined with other data sets, and I'll talk about that in just a second, is, is a tremendously valuable and tremendously important, given everything that's happening in the world right now, data source. Again, I'm, I told you I'm gonna go through some, some examples here. This is one that I thought was really cool. So this is working with a, um, uh, a mass merchant retailer. Again, I won't give you the name, it's just it's a global mass merchant retailer. 
Um, one of the problems that they were having in their lawn and garden centers was that they didn't have a sort of a uniform way of watering plants. So if one garden, one lawn and garden, garden manager might be watering plants in a different way than others. So they wanted to have a sort of a uniform way where they're all sort of watering the plants at the same time. So what we did is we created an application for them that basically looked at uh, rainfall, both past and for future. Um, we also used some of that data from pairs that I mentioned before uh, to, to look at uh, uh, evaporative trans, trans, transfer, transformation, uh, evaporation. Wow, I'm having a hard time with getting that word out. So that we can measure how dry is likely the um, the, uh, the dirt going to be, especially for the products that are out in the uh, in the parking lot. And, and literally, we created a model that enabled them to basically gave them a uh, uh, a message on their like in-store um, um, uh, device that they used to sort of plan the store, and it would it would give them uh, twice a day instructions as to which plants they should water, number one, and how much each plant should get based on all the things I just talked about. So, I, and 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 basically by doing that. Uh, the expectation was that they would save uh, almost $40 million in wastage because this is a really, really big company. So again, a, just kind of a, a cool sort of example of how this kind of information from a supply chain perspective can be can be integrated. And there's a, there's a million different stories of, that, I can, that I can share, but I, even though I have an hour, I'm going to have limited time. Um, so now a couple of other quick, quick examples of, of uh, Work that we've done both before and after the acquisition by by the weather by the by IBM, but but I think these are use cases that are that are illustrative illustrative of this whole idea of leveraging weather data in a way that is proactive and that can provide value to your customers. So the story behind this is that we we were uh, doing a, 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 an a we were working on an ad campaign that was sort of a partnership between Pantene shampoo and Walgreens, and basically what we did is we literally measured the uh, impact of weather on different types of shampoos. So as it turns out, there's shampoos that you use if the air is dry, the shampoos that you use if the, hair, if the, if the air is humid, um, and all kinds of variations in between. So basically what we did is we, we looked at um, sales data, we looked at the weather data, and we sort of created a model that enabled us to identify and sense when the weather condition was gonna drive specific different types of quote unquote bad hair days. Uh, then that was used uh, combined with some location data so we can we could see where somebody was anonymously um, and then we could serve them ad messages and this was on weather.com um, when they needed would need a specific type of hair or uh, shampoo and it would also point them to the nearest uh, Walgreens. It was very very successful it won an Effie award um, um, you can see that the results here is a, a, a 10% increase in sales of Walgreens uh, there was a year over year sales increase of 24% from the Pantene products. And then there was this halo effect because people were going into a Walgreens having a bad hair day. And so the entire hair care category got a, got a benefit. Uh, on the right side is uh, the uh, an article that was written in the Wall Street Journal about this specific case. Um, and it, 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 for me, I always like to, even though it's a, it's a little dated, um, you can imagine how things have, have changed since, since then. It was 2013. Jeez, it was at the very early days when, when the, after I'd been hired and we started started building out this technology. But but again, I think it's a, a great example of how the 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 data in this case was used proactively and used to provide value to a customer. And basically, it transformed what normally you would think of as an advertisement into something that became useful, which helps sort of drive these kind of metrics. Uh, another example. This is with Scott now. You know, I talked about the value of, of understanding the weather and the weather forecast. Um, one of the things that we do and other companies do as well, but we've been doing it probably longer than anybody else, is we do uh, longer range forecasts. We've been doing that for probably 25 years, you know, back to the days of WSI. Um, and primarily for the energy company, for energy companies is where that, the, that, that all started. But yeah, we've basically, lever we're leveraging that data now to support our, our retail and CPG co customers as well as energy companies. This exact example was specifically focused on Scott's, uh, Scott's Miracle Grow. Of course, Scott's has got a tremendous weather uh, weather exposure in the spring. Uh, they've got a certain amount of time to sell their sell their products, and if the weather's bad, it's going to have an impact on them. In this case, what happened was that um, on the back of analytics to understand, okay, what what are the weather drivers that are going to be the most significant to the lawn garden business, um, and which retailers are going to be impacted the most. Um, the, we provided them with a long range forecast. So this is a forecast that went out two or three months. 
Um, and based on that forecast and based on the expectation that that weather would have a negative impact on consumer behavior, they made one very important decision. They decided to hold off on their big marketing spend uh, until the weather was expected to break, so like a month later. Um, because of the fact that they, and it worked, and so because of the fact that they had appropriately timed that, that ad, they attributed that to about a $30 million bump. Now, uh, what, the, the problem is if you miss time advertisements like this for seasonal product categories, um, those are typically dollars you don't get back because it's, uh, people don't buy. If, it's, if the weather's cold and rainy, they're not going to buy lawn and garden stuff in March. But if they wait till April, they're going to, not only are they going to buy one, they're going to buy two. So that was an example of how that data worked. Uh, this is another, another quick example. This is uh, Subway. Um, this, is, this again is from um, work that we did on the advertising side. And just full disclosure, when I was hired by the weather company to create an analytics business, our initial focus was on, uh, the, um, on advertising, which is the, the core piece of the business, which is why I have more examples of that um, because we have more examples of that. We're much more mature in that. And it's also um, where we've leveraged in, in, a, in a, large, a large way uh, AI. Um, to sort of create really interesting and uh, impactful ads. So in this case, we basically leverage weather and location data as well as AI to identify people that were going to be uh, most um, uh, have a higher propensity to to go to Subway, even if they had not been to that Subway. Uh, but we then layered in the weather data, and then we send out advertisements similar to the way we were doing it with Walgreens. In this case, um, the the store traffic increase was measured at 31%. The article was, in, was posted in, in Mobile Marketer. And by only serving up ads to the right people at the right time, it, it reduced their campaign waste by about 53%. So again, another example of the value and the power of these kind of understanding of understanding weather data in this way. Um, a couple of things that we're doing now, which I, I, th I think were relevant for this audience and relevant for today, and certainly relevant for today after uh, Lauren's awesome presentation this morning, is that we've developed a, uh, uh, what we call a COVID-19 decision support system. But basically what we've done is we've developed uh, predictive technology that enables us to predict not the COVID spread, but the, the effect of COVID on consumers within individual markets. So it's, it's, it's more of a, more like a, of a sentiment forecast. It's being able to impact, be able to predict based on current conditions. So what is the current condition? And we, we literally source the data from John Hopkins. Um, we look at factors like the VIX to get a sense of uh, uh, how the, the the market is is, is reacting and, and what the, um, the sort of the sentiment is on the street because that will ultimately impact the stock market, which then will impact people at the, at the county level. Um, and then we look at various other data points, including uh, hospital data, um, other types of economic data, as well as social media data, so that we can predict um, about 40, 45 days in advance the expected effect of the, um, the the COVID threat on consumers in each of those counties. Again, it's not a prediction of COVID. It's a prediction of how the effect of COVID is likely to shape consumer behavior and consumer demand um, in at a county level all across the U.S. And now we scale that to other to other countries as well. And the, the use case here is for um, you know, any business that that is dealing with people. So uh, retail CPG. Uh, even the government, I'm working with some government agencies that are leveraging this as well, as well as pharma companies, uh, to get a better sense of what the likely, likelihood of the, the impact of COVID on the sentiment in different areas. Um, okay, so now now we get to the point of rethinking, re-rethinking weather. So this is the, the, the next normal. So everything that I just gave you is work that, that, that's been happening, um, the sort of transition or the, that, that, that has been happening over the last seven or eight years, and again, I've been doing this for a long time, but the, 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 the acceleration of, of adoption of, of weather and, of, and data in this kind has been going up dramatically. It's really going up dramatically now, and it's going up dramatically for all the obvious reasons, you know, with the, the fact that we are, you know, we all basically have to, to rethink and businesses have to rethink how they work with people. But one of the things I wanted to share with you is, is the sort of um, the, 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 the ability to create from data, from internal data, a platform. They basically taking in data that might reside within your own company, bringing in other external data, and then using that to create uh, products or services for your customer that might be unique, that might be things that you haven't even envisioned before, but that would be valuable for your customers. 
and and so there's a real that there's a real opportunity here and i think there's a real move here towards for businesses for chief data officers to begin to look at the resource that they're sitting on their data resource as a potential way to create additional value for the company so not just managing the data but actually using the data in a way that's going to drive value and, and drive business uh, the example i'm giving here is and we're doing we're doing a lot of this work out there but this is one that's the, the most public i know that i can share with you publicly and it's with the yara yara is a large international producer of fertilizer um, and it's a very very large company based in the netherlands i believe um, and we started a partnership with them about a year and a half ago and it was to help them create a, a digital technology that can be used to support their customers and their customers are all over the world and also have a lot of customers that are like small farmers uh, in, in, in India and uh, in other areas of the world. And by basically merging the data sets that we bring to the table, including the data that I mentioned before from pairs, but also the weather data because it's a, it's a global weather data site, data site um, they are then able to sort of create this platform that their customers can use large and small to be able to better anticipate the impact of the weather on their crop to be able to better anticipate the, the yield that, that is going to be produced by their crop and of course for Yara that means that they're also going to be able to help them um, uh, decide what kind of Yara you know, products that they're going to need based on the, uh, the modeling and forecasting that's going, that's going on. So to, uh, to me, it, this is a, a really good example of the sort of the, 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 the platform opportunity and it's a really good example of how the world is changing from, lar from large companies that have large sets of data that they're sitting on to start rethinking how they, they use that data and then re rethinking how they use the weather data to combine it with that data to create something that's new and valuable to their customers. And I think that's just going to be something that we're going to see a lot of going forward. And it's, it's really where uh, CDOs are going to be um, uh, sitting on a really important part of the business because ultimately they'll be able to create value um, for their own business as well as the customers by you know, looking at weather and thinking about weather that way. The other thing, and this is actually my final slide, so I think I'm, I think I'm right on time actually. Um, the, the, what's happened here over the last four or five years, um, for all the reasons I mentioned, um, and I think again, I, I think uh, the, um, the acquisition of the weather company by IBM, I think, uh, uh, opened the floodgates here in terms of uh, innovation and technology um, uh, as it relates to this exact topic. So there's been a lot of money going into startups, um, lots and lots of uh, new startups out there um, looking at, you know, how to create a better mousetrap as it relates to a weather forecast, how to create uh, new financial instruments. I haven't, I, don't, I haven't had time to talk about that, but um, there's, there's a, there's a growing need and a growing um, appetite for uh, weather risk products where a company can actually uh, effectively insure themselves against um, weather conditions that are going to be so impactful that you really can't operationalize against it, but you can put in place a hedge using what's called a weather derivative to, to protect yourself against those kind of, um, those kind of events. Um, so that's, those things are all happening almost at, at breakneck speed. And you know, one of the things that I found over the last three or four months working here from my home office uh, doing uh, WebExes and Zoom calls is that the, the level of interest and the level of uh, velocity of companies sort of rethinking and, and looking at this kind of data, became, largely because of the fact that there's such a trend towards uh, uh, multi-channel or digital sort of um, evolution, um, the, the, there's just a lot, of, a lot of interest in this. Um, and so the, the, the fi my final point here is that you know, whether data integration is really, it's, it's a real time resilient solution. So when we talk about climate change, oftentimes we think about 2050 or 2060 or 2070, but the reality is now. Um, and the reality is that we have, from a data perspective, the capability to better understand how these uh, increasingly volatile weather conditions are likely to impact our citizens and our customers. And so there's no reason that we shouldn't be leveraging that data to help them better, um, better um, uh, deal with those kind of informations. Um, I mentioned the fact that there's more participants and, and also, and I think really important for this audience is that there's a real opportunity uh, to create new, um, unique and, and, and critical value from the data uh, that you guys are all sitting on. Uh, so with that, I am pretty much done with the prepared parts of this and I am happy to take questions. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Paul. That was a really great presentation. I personally really enjoyed it. Uh, it's very interesting what you do. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we, we do have a few questions that came in and we have about five minutes left. So I think we have time. Okay. Um, first one, how do you decide what data is to be shared and how? What data is to be shared? I'm not sure I understand the context of that. Um, I couldn't tell you uh, without clarifying with the person else. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, okay. I will say though, the, the in terms of the data, the, the types of data that we use, it, it really becomes, and, and again, I work for IBM services. So I work, I'm a basic professional services. I work with clients to create like bespoke solutions. So the type of data that we use is specific to the business problem that we're trying to solve. So it, there's, there's many, many different types of data. Um, and um, most of that, of course, is proprietary to whoever we're working with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, why is the European model considered more accurate than American models? <laughs> there's a weather geek in the crowd. <laughs> and the, the, yeah, and, and uh, he is correct. The European model is, is uh, basically uh, routinely provides a better forecast. Uh, than the, the American model, but it's not, it's not, they're not the same all the time. Um, sometimes the American model will be a little bit better. I will say that the way that we deal with that is that we use machine learning and we, we combine a lot of the, the weather forecasts. I mentioned before, we, we bring together 162 different models and then we use that to basically take the best bits out of all of them. And so that's the way the best, the best sort of companies leverage data. Um, for those of you that uh, are familiar with that question, and if you've watched the Weather Channel or even and most of the most of the news here in the U.S., they always compare the weather, the uh, the American model versus the European model, and that, that's always a, a kind of a bugaboo. Uh, but we'll catch up. And, but in the meantime, I, as part of a global team, uh, we use whatever whatever the data is the best. <laughs> Thank you so much for that answer. Okay, last question. I think we have time. We got three minutes left. How are you assessing the increasing delivery economy in weather context? I, I think I understand that question. And, 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 uh, and it's a really good question because the, it adds a whole nother wrinkle to the, the, the sort of the delivery economy. So when we move into winter and all of a sudden where you've got bad weather that's gonna potentially impact people actually being able to, to deliver things, it has a whole different sort of context to um, being able to do that. And, you know, we do work with customers where um, we predict the, the likelihood of traffic, we predict the, um, the expected impact of traffic and weather on drive times. Um, all of those things then become embedded into like a dashboard so that they, these companies can begin to try, think differently about um, what the drive time will be. But it's a, it's a great question and it's more and more of these kind of new things that we're sort of uncovering, these new sort of challenges and opportunities that are coming from this new, this new world that we're living in, which is based on uh, Zoom and uh, WebEx and uh, us working in our jammies from our home office. Perfect. Peter, do you have any closing remarks? No, thank you very much, Paul. This adds a, uh, di a very different dimension, a relevant dimension, uh, to all of the concerns, I think, that uh, the organizations who are attending today have to consider. And we look forward to further exploring it down the road. Can I make one, one last point? So yes. the, I, I, I mentioned the graph forecast. It was all developed by, led by my colleague, Dr. Peter Neely, who is a proud MIT PhD grad. So I just wanted to give him a shout out. And MIT too. <laughs> Great, thank you. All right, thank you again so much, Paul, for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here and share your knowledge and expertise with us. It's really invaluable. Um, and to our audience, we have a 30 minute break coming up and then we will be back for the next set of sessions. Uh, we'll have two panel sessions with Randy Bean and Deloitte. Um, and we'll also hear from Michael Conlon and Mark Ramsey. So go stretch your legs, grab some coffee, use the restroom, whatever you, you gotta do. And then we will see you back at 3.30. Eastern. Thank you. Thank you.